From the home studios of the Teaching Systems Lab at MIT, this is Teach Lab, a podcast about the art and craft of teaching. I'm Justin Reich. With me today is John Palfrey. John Palfrey is the president of the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. Um, he's the former director of the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. He's the former headmaster of the Phillips Academy at Andover. Uh, he's a former professor of law at Harvard Law and a visiting law professor for the winter term. And he's the author of some great books about youth and education, Born Digital, How Children Grow Up in a Digital Age, more recently, Safe Spaces, Brave Spaces, about conversation in schools, and finally, coming out very recently, is The Connected Parent, an expert guide to parenting in a digital world. John Palfrey, thanks for joining us on Teach Lab. Justin, thank you. I'm thrilled to be here, and I love your podcast, and it's like to be a guest. It is an extraordinarily difficult time in the United States and around the world. And I think one of the most difficult things about it is the way that we're seeing inequalities in our society, both exposed, sort of revealed in ways that we don't normally see them, but then also expanded. Um, as you look at that as a head of a foundation, um, how, how do you think about that inequality and, and what role does philanthropy have to play in addressing some of it? Well, Justin, it is, I think, absolutely central to the work that we do at MacArthur Foundation, and it is central to our mission to try to close those uh, gaps and to be a part of the solution. We can't all do, do it all on our own, despite having billions of dollars in the bank, which is a nice thing, but it's not enough. But we can certainly be uh, a force for good and to make progress every day toward it. And so it really is the North Star for us to focus on racial and ethnic equity uh, in the United States and in the places we operate around the world. Um, MacArthur doesn't do a lot in education funding, so you might be able to give us a kind of um, an unbiased philanthropist's view. Um, but, you know, we see in education these sort of yawning gaps um, appearing and expanding everywhere. If you're a philanthropist who does have some funding that's designed to address education, like what what advice would you give for folks? And this might work with people with millions of dollars, but it also might work for people with hundreds of dollars. Um, what, what, what can people do with giving that can address these kinds of inequalities that are like deeply embedded in systems? I think there are many things that philanthropists can do and that philanthropic organizations can do. But as you said, we each can be a philanthropist right down to our household. So I think there are many ways we can act in that way. So you're right, MacArthur Foundation doesn't have a big education program. We have funded a fair amount in education in the past. Our digital media and learning initiative was hundreds of millions of dollars on, on this topic. And I think having an equity lens on the grant making uh, as we did in that program and and for all of our things is is important. So I would say, I would start there and basically say, when you're doing the grant making, are you paying attention both to who you're giving the money to in terms of ensuring that it's not all white people or all straight white men and whatever, but also who is being served through that philanthropy. So you need to think about the heat map of where the the young people who are being served by that are are um, are uh, are based. And I think we haven't done enough in philanthropy to be data driven in that way and to be honest and accountable. Uh, shortly and maybe uh, it may be already out before this podcast comes out. But MacArthur Foundation is releasing our first ever demographic survey, looking at all of our grantees and and being as open as we can about our data. So I would think being uh, clear clear about what your benchmark is and, and improving that over time in terms of who is leading the work and who's being served. Those would be a couple of quick things for big foundations. The other thing I would just add is, again, as you said, you know, anybody can be a philanthropist and I hope that everybody who has the means to do it will be giving money in this COVID year for sure, but uh, over time. And I think seeking out the kinds of organizations that ought to be supported and, and really need the, need the support um, and think having an equity lens to your own giving is really important too, and not just giving to the organizations that you know and that are similar to you. Will the equity audit, the demographic audit, look both at the people you're directly giving money to and then also the people they're serving? Are you going to try to sort of quantify the demographics of the, of the people who are the ultimate recipients of, you know, you give money to organizations and then an organization serve people. Are you sort of measuring demographics in the organizations or in the people that you serve? Both of those levels matter a lot, I think, Justin, both in terms of ensuring that we're supporting 
people of color, uh, people who are uh, in marginalized situations in lots of different communities, as well as then focusing on who's being served. This particular thing that we're announcing next week is focused on the grantees and the organizations and looking at the heads of those organizations, the board, the staff, and so forth, and, and really just trying to set a baseline. We've never done this before, but we are uh, eager to do it and then to have something from which we can measure our progress. But we also, in other settings, and, and this is one very specific to Chicago, are looking at that second question, which is to say, who is being served? So we have been, a, a a member of various partnerships in the COVID response uh, in the last few months. Uh, one is with a group of organizations, philanthropies in particular, but individuals too, who have given to the immediate uh, response to COVID. And then we're now with a group that's looking at equitable recovery. And we are mapping using a heat map in the city of Chicago to say what neighborhoods are being served and what individuals are being served through that. And I think looking at both of those levels, you know, not probably going to get it exactly right in every way, but having a baseline and then saying, okay, Okay, does this look about right or is it way off and how do we change it and, and ensure that we're being a force for good? Yeah, it seems like that data could be really powerful in the sense that um, we're, often, we're often compelled to give to those nearest us um, and those nearest us might have levels of affluence that's similar to ours. Um, and so affluent white folks <laughs> might, you know, be really inclined to give money to organizations that mostly fo you know, benefit affluent white folks, you know, which is, which is going to expand rather than uh, decrease educational inequality. It's a, you know, it's a little in the school settings, it makes me think of parent teacher associations. Absolutely. It's a great example. Where there's a really natural inclination. Of course, you want to give money to your kid's school, but if we only give money to the schools that are closest to us, um, then people who go to schools in affluent neighborhoods will have lots of philanthropy and people who go to schools in less affluent neighborhoods will, will have less. Exactly. Um, you know, there are trillions of dollars that go into education systems, just like there are trillions of dollars that go into healthcare systems and social welfare systems and other like that. And so philanthropy in some ways ends up being a relatively small part of that. I mean, it seems like massive amounts of money. Um, how do you think about um, what can be big amounts of money to an individual donor, but is actually small amounts of money in the whole system? Like how, how does, you know, if I, if I was a philanthropist thinking about serving schools, um, one piece of advice you've given us is really think about, you know, who is the downstream recipient of funding um, and how do we make sure um, that they're not just people who look like and are connected to us? Um, what, other, what other guidance do you have for folks thinking about these, these big complex systems where, where money can be a lot to an individual and organization, but not that much to the whole system? It's a great and crucial question. So just to put it in context, MacArthur Foundation has a little under $7 billion. And that sounds like a lot of money, and it is. Uh, but if you take 5% of that, and we give out more than 5%, but let's just take the, the, the kind of basic mass, if that gives you 300 and something million dollars a year, as you say, just in the city of Chicago, where we are based, you know, it is a, it would be a drop in the bucket if we gave the entire amount that we're giving out, even to just the Chicago public schools alone, right? It would not actually move the needle. It'd be helpful, I suppose, and it'd probably help some individual schools and some individual kids, but it would not change the system. And thinking of your book, Failure to Disrupt, and the way you're thinking about scale and leverage and so forth, you know, you have to get some of that. You have to get some scale and leverage. So one way to think about that is to support individual leaders who are operating in that way. So MacArthur is best known perhaps for the MacArthur Fellows Program, and that's a way in which we give to 20 to 25 creative individuals each year who are going to have a major contribution over time and, and to disrupt or to uh, add to through their lifetime's work uh, systems. And what we do is we give them totally unrestricted money. So if you win a MacArthur Fellowship, which for which you can't apply, you receive five years of $125,000 a year. So you receive $625,000, no strings attached. We don't ever call you again. We're always happy to see you and talk to you. But basically, you don't have to do anything for us, no reports. And we just are believing in those unbelievably talented individuals to make big change through what they do. So that's one way to think about it. But I think another way is to say, let's look at the particular things that are out there that you could do as a philanthropist that would then make sure that other things flow to them. So MacArthur has the advantage of being famous in our, in our field. And so sometimes when we give money to an organization or a person, it helps them raise other money. And so we've launched an organization called Lever for Change, which is a affiliated organization. And um, through that, we are helping to uh, ensure that others who are changing things are able to raise more money. 
um, and to lever up what we're doing. Last thing I'd say is your point about literally trillions this year of stimulus dollars going out to uh, help people recover from this, this coronavirus issue. And if we are able to ensure that that money goes to others who are needing it and can and shape the way that that recovery money goes, that can be really helpful. So one thing we're focused on in Chicago as an example is giving money to organizations that are led by black people and brown people in our city to ensure that they have the technical assistance to be able to apply for funds, whether that's through impact investments, um, which is one part of what we do, um, or in terms of other kinds of support like the money that's flowing in tens of millions of dollars to do contact tracing as an example. So those are little grants from us, um, but where the technical expertise can really help unlock really big dollars. So I think there are a bunch of ways that you can get scale uh, through philanthropy, but you have to be clever about it. And I think this notion of philanthropy is kind of, you know, pushing snowballs down the hill that can grow. I mean, I do think that can work at smaller local levels, you know, that, that small donations to, um, you know, parent teachers associations can give people the freedom and flexibility to write grants for larger amounts of money. I yep. know in, in the city of Boston, um, there's an organization called Edvestors, um, which celebrates the school on the move each year. They give one school that's doing interesting things a grant that also helps them attract more attention. It gives them an award. It helps them raise more money from other sources and, and things like that. It probably helps them, you know, negotiate and be recognized by the city and so forth. And so, um, yeah, it's great to think about, um, you know, I, I, again, our individual philanthropy is going to be less than $300 million a year. Right. Uh, but this, but the scope that you describe is sort of this, you know, I just looked up that the, you're, you're right, that the Chicago public school system spends $8.6 billion a year. Right, um, it's more than our entire corpus, our entire endowment. We could decapitalize in one one time, and it would it would just it would help, but not would, change. It would less than double the budget for right. a year, you know, three hundred million a year, whatever that is. It's gonna it's gonna be one twenty. It'll be a five percent boost to the budget. Right. Um, so I really like that idea about thinking of philanthropy as ways of celebrating, gathering attention, building capacity to be able to negotiate for more funds. Um, I I think that's very helpful. Um, so you and your colleague Urs Gasser have a book that's coming out this month. Will, will probably be already released by the time um, that this podcast comes out. The I have it. The Connected Parent. Got Absolutely. it in front of us. You've yeah. got copies. Um, the Connected Jesus. Parent. Um, you've you've already written um, some books about digital learning and digital youth. Um, what got you thinking and writing about parenthood? Well, truly being a parent was where it really started. And this is a familiar story uh, to anybody who has, you know, has a kid, all of a sudden you're in a conversation about how am I supposed to do this? And there's, you know, famously no uh, um, manual for how to raise a kid when you come come back with them out of, you know, out of the hospital. And uh, But there's you know, really no manual to raise the kid in, in an internet connected era. I mean, so many of our parenting strategies come from our own parents. Um, Absolutely, yeah. our own our own experience, or our grandparents, or whoever you know, whoever's close by, you know, the auntie who is so important in the in the niece's life and so forth, and and those are all good things. But they, but you're right that not, none have have grown up with this this amount of connectivity, and certainly not with a COVID level of connectivity. Um, and so the 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 um, source of this book really was Urs and I. We were uh, at that time partners across great seas. Uh, you know, Urs was in um, in Switzerland, and I was at Harvard, and we were running research centers that were uh, collaborating, and we both had kids of kind of the same age and both were engaged in similar conversations with our partners. And uh, we decided to do our homework in public basically and to see what we could learn about young people as they were growing up. And, and Born Digital, which came out in 2008, really was a research book. It was sort of a research synthesis, more or less um, looking at what we could know about uh, how kids were growing up in a digital era. And that was you know, primarily as a, you know, meant for researchers and, and that conversation. Um, the Connected Parent, which is our new book, is really an outgrowth of the many, many, many conversations we've had with parents and teachers in the last decade or so, who often said, I'm glad the research says that, but what's your advice? And we would say, well, we're researchers, we don't give advice. Yeah. Um, and at a certain point, that became hard to uh, stand behind. And also our you know, publisher said, hey, it would be great if you could just update you know, and do a book that actually has the advice and, and really in a simple way, uh, according to each thing. So when people say, you know, okay, so those are the data about screen time, what am I supposed to do as a parent at these different ages? We decided to give it our best shot. Um, what, are, what are the key pieces of advice in the book or what are the pieces of advice in the book that sort of most surprised you while you were writing it? 
Well, you know, I think a lot of it is how commonsensical all of this is actually, right? Uh, most of it does have to do with balance and being led not by fear, but by your, you know, your sense of, uh, of uh, what the data say. And so um, we approach this as social scientists. And so there's, there's not that many surprises in it when you think about what we try to do as, as parents, which is we balance some sense of independence for kids and agency and so forth, while also, uh, you know, keeping them safe enough and giving them, uh, giving them the skills that they need. Um, and, and also that, you know, it does change over the course of somebody's life. So, you know, what you do for a one-year-old is very different than what you do for an 18-year-old, now having an 18-year-old at, at the end of his high school career. And, you know, and thinking about how the data help us uh, along the way in, in sharing those, those things. And, and nothing, you know, I think for parents, um, uh, uh, it, no matter who you are, and, and realizing all families are different and challenges are different in different environments, nothing in 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 the research is actually all that scary. Um, but it's but it's helpful, I think, to think about it, um, to step back from it, and to look at uh, data driven advice, and then at least make your choices on the basis of those data. Is there anything in the book that you feel like you wish you could have revised during the pandemic? Is there any way that having us all forced at home and spending much more time, you know, both with our families, but also with our screens um, and our families with our screens at the same time often, um, is there, is, are there, are there, does the, does the pandemic turn change, change your thinking or highlight certain parts of your advice more than others? Well, I've had a laugh with many different researchers on the topic of screen time, of course, because it's now gone way out the window. If you try to have particular limits on screen time when a kid is in, you know, entirely virtual school, yeah, yeah. You know, how are you supposed to say you shouldn't have X hours, right? It's okay. completely ridiculous. So that's certainly one where, you know, for those of us who are working from home and have that great privilege and can stay safe in that way, or where our kids are in a virtual school, you know, you have to think about that completely differently. And you have to not worry that much about screen time. Now, we say in the book, and the data say very clearly, Really focus on the quality of the screen time, not on the quantity. So the, the data, you know, give you a guide for that. But that's certainly one way in which the conversation has just dramatically changed in the COVID era. Um, one of the things that struck me, I don't remember where I saw this, it was connected to research that came out from the American Pediatrics Association and some surveys associated with that, um, that if you survey parents, or maybe it was surveying kids and ask them, what kinds of rules they have at home for using technology, um, kids with alarming frequency will say none. Um, that they, that, uh, you know, like, like the, as I understand, the American Pediatrics Association, like basically had two pieces of advice, which is really try to limit screen time for kids below the age of two right. and have some kind of rule. Um, not totally clear what those rules should be, but some kind of rule. Um, for, for families that don't have rules yet, um, or guidelines, but should probably start having something. Um, do you have advice on sort of where to start that conversation? That sounds exactly right. And, and I think you, you, you frame it in precisely the right way, which is have the conversation. It, the, uh, the idea of being a connected parent is actually having a conversation in times that are not dire and that are not scary and that allows you to have the conversation when things are trickier. So I think that's, that's a big part of it. Letting kids have some degree of agency in those rules. They, they can't make all the rules, but they can certainly talk to you about it. We have a few stories in the book where we describe ways in which our own kids told us the rules you have are stupid. This would be a better rule. We then said, all right, we'll try your rule. And you know what? They tend to be right when they give you a better rule and they're, and they're you know, they're thoughtful kids. So I think there's a, there's a lot there, but absolutely the, the American Academy of Pediatrics and I'm a big believer in, in much of what they do. Um, and I should admit my mother was the president of the AAP um, when some of these things came out. So I, I feel connected to the, the rulemaking. Um, I, think, I think ensuring that there are some rules and then, then over time, noting those rules are going to change. And one thing that's very difficult is starting rules when kids are 16 or 17, right? That's just not gonna happen. So having some rules that you then can relax is actually the way to go. So start with a conversation when kids are you know, three, four, five, um, make sure that they know that there are rules associated with it. When they get that first you know, smartphone, maybe around age 13 or so, then there's a different set of rules and then they go on to you know, be much more on their own. And uh, as later teens, they're going to have uh, many fewer rules, but at least you will then be able to relax it over time and ha have them make sense for the age uh, of those children. One of the things that I tried to write about in Failure to Disrupt is this notion that informal learning can be really profoundly changed by new technologies that, you know, um, 
my kids are very young when they're interested in anything. Um, they have this terrible habit of defaulting to asking Siri, which is of course perfectly normal for them. And, um, but in my crotchety old age, like I just hate having that voice in the house and um, having them turn to it. Although I recognize it as one of those things, which is like, yeah, well, you know, Socrates hated writing too. So mm -hmm. just get used to these things. Um, but I argue that school systems really uh, struggle to incorporate new technologies into learning um, because it requires too many adjustments to routines to be really powerful and effective. Um, and that in fact, for a lot of the things that we want folks to learn, um, humans remain kind of an indisp indispensable part of the equation. Um, you know, you, you are the headmaster of a school and I'm wondering what kind of parallels you see between you know, being a connected parent, having technology operate in some kind of thoughtful way in the home um, versus being a leader of a school community and having technology um, be incorporated into a much larger, more complex system. Absolutely, Justin. So uh, one little anecdote, if I might, uh, on your Siri point, and then, then I'll answer your question directly. But um, a few years ago, I was writing a different book, which was called Bibliotech, and it was about libraries, and I decided to write the book while sitting in libraries. So I was sitting in a particular library, and it was in a reading room, and it was about 3 p.m., which is, as anybody who sits in libraries knows, a magical time in a small town because kids come in from school at that moment. They come streaming in, and you know, one of the reasons I love libraries is they are public open spaces where any kid can come, and they get you know, um, warmth in the winter, and they get you know, cool in the summer and they get maybe, you know, a safe place to sit and so forth. And they also learn something. But so sitting there and about 15 minutes later, some kid was trying to figure out what terminal velocity meant. And so grabbed his phone and he said, Siri, what does terminal velocity mean? And at that moment, I saw the librarian who was sitting there just looking, just completely amused at this whole thing. Siri didn't actually give a good answer to terminal velocity, but here you have you know, this kid who's in a library with a librarian, a person right there who could actually give them this like great way to figure this answer. And of course, what's he doing? He's turning to Siri, who is not giving a good answer. Anyway, that, you know, that, that for my mind, encapsulated the uh, a moment in time. Now, maybe someday Siri will actually give a really good answer. Um, and that makes the librarian's job more complicated, but that's a different story. Um, uh, I think your, your question about the ways in which parents and schools adapt is, is really essential. And um, I would say one thing about the connected parenting approach is that we need to connect what happens in the household to what happens in third places like libraries and, and outside in, uh, in ways they're learning you know, on playing fields and so forth and what's happening in formal schooling. And I would say this is one of the key contributions of MacArthur's digital media and learning investments was focusing on that informal set of learning that was called connected learning. So exactly what you're describing, that trajectory um, is what we're trying to capture from a parenting perspective and connected parenting. But within the context of a, an official school, I will say I was struck by at a really extraordinary school, how, you know, unbelievable stories I can tell you about wonderful teaching, really just over the top wonderful teaching and learning, but also how hard it was to change the pedagogy at all. Now, in the case of Andover, it is a school that has been operating for 240 something years really, really well at the top of its game at a global level. And there are reasons why not to change stuff when you are really good at what you do. And I stand behind lots of what's going on. On the other hand, you need also to be improving at it at all times. And in fact, I think that's one of the things that a great school actually does is disrupt, disrupt itself and its own systems and its own approaches. And particularly when we look at a society where I think most of us, anyway, those of us on the left, broadly global left, would say we're not where we ought to be, right? From an equity perspective, from, a, uh, from all sorts of, uh, along all sorts of dimensions we want to improve. And certainly the quality of K to 12 education in the United States, that's not something we're that good at overall. Therefore, we need to disrupt it. We need to do it better. And that's actually not something that most teachers uh, and most schools are that good at doing within the bounds of the institution. Yeah, my hope is that technology can sometimes be one of the best entry points into those conversations about change. Um, in fact, it's probably the main reason that I've remained interested in education technology. I agree with everything you said that sort of um, change in institutions is hard. Changing schools is hard because they're just very complex places. Um, changing them where teaching is excellent, um, or at least has really excellent outcomes, um, is also really hard. And if there's, you know, it, it, learning technology seem to be one of the few things um, that can at least get people to, to sit up from their routines and look around and go, oh, this thing is kind of different. Um, and I'm interested in the degree to which the, the 
pandemic will play a similar role in that of saying, oh, um, we did have to do some things differently with remote teaching and learning. And a lot of them were bad and a lot of them we weren't happy with, but some of them were actually pretty good. Um, I mean, I guess I've sort of been disappointed to some extent at how few schools have really taken the opportunity to say, um, oh, you know, these are, there are a bunch of things we really could get rid of now as we boil down to the essentials. Um, but though I'm certainly sympathetic to those places as well as they try to, um, you know, navigate all of this complexity. Absolutely. And, you know, I think as I, as I was reading through failure to disrupt in the galleys format, I was so struck by one line you had uh, that's in the introduction. You say, finally, most importantly, I remain convinced that even though technology alone will not disrupt systems, I certainly agree with you there, technology can abet system change. And thinking to, you know, kind of, you know, where do you see those those biggest opportunities? And, and can this COVID moment be one where, in fact, uh, the change does come about in, in some meaningful and, and sustainable ways? And hopefully those conversations are deeply intertwined with conversations about equity, um, conversations about, um, you know, who has access to, you know, learning resources, who has access to safe places to learn, um, who, you know, how do we treat people in similar ways or different ways um, in classrooms in online circumstances and, and other things like that. So I'm hopeful that, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not much one for sort of silver linings for the pandemic. I think it is mostly really, really, really bad. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm certainly curious if there are ways that schools are going to figure out how to, um, how to use technology, how to use this experience of profound change to ask good questions about, um, you know, what, what might we do differently if we had, uh, if we had the opportunity. And Justin, as a, as a researcher of this, and I know, of course, when Harvard X launched, you were the, the kind of in-house but independent researcher of, of that, that project and have done this, this otherwise, I was thinking about the opportunity of this natural experiment that so many kids are in classrooms and so many kids are out of classrooms and there are a whole bunch of different pedagogical approaches going. Are we running the tape, do you think, well enough in terms of capturing what's, what's working, what's not, where those possible are to abet system change? I think we'll, I think we'll have two big challenges. One is a really long-term one, which is that we often actually don't know what is in fact happening in schools. Um, and this is something that predates the pandemic. Um, there are a lot of classrooms. They're very small. Um, they're very separated from one another. They're not instrumented very well, oftentimes by design. Um, I think we're finding all kinds of ways during the pandemic that it turns out that like having cameras running all the time is not good for teaching and learning. Um, but it does raise, I think, a real serious concern that like, we just don't know what's happening. Um, I, we were talking earlier today with Dan Meyer, who developed a piece of software with others called Desmos. Um, and he said something like, you know, if you know a teacher who's doing really well under these circumstances, um, then, uh, you know, they must be on performance enhancing drugs because yeah. I don't know how to find that person. And I have the same thing of, you know, having lots of conversations like, have you heard about a district that's doing this really well? Mm -hmm. um, and most people go, nope. Um, which is not a critique of teachers and it's not a critique of districts. It's just, it's a really hard time. They're, they're, it's hard to even, I, it's, we don't know that many practices that are going on. And if there are practices that are really good, it's sort of hard to identify them because we, we don't know, you know, they're, they're not kind of rising to the surface as obviously good, which is connected to the second problem, which is that if a school is doing really well right now, um, we're going to find out about it 10 years from now um, when their students have, you know, slightly better six-year college persistence rates. Um, you know, I, this seems like a classic case where um, I think it's very unlikely that, say, the schools that have the best test scores in 2021, 2022 are also the places that did the best job managing COVID. Um, you know, the, the, it's really hard to figure out what should be the indicators we should be looking at right now, which I think is difficult. You know, I would think about you as a philanthropist and, you know, trying to do good kind of data driven grant making, you know, who would you reach out to in the city of Chicago that you felt like would be leaders on these issues? Um, I think both descriptively just in terms of what is happening and then from a outcomes perspective, life outcomes, learning perspective, all this stuff is really hard to know right now. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. But it is the task of researchers to try to figure this out. I mean, in our own lab, you know, the way that we started was just, um, you know, we said, let's just start interviewing teachers. You know, we're, we're going to find 40 of them across the country and just have them describe what's going on. Um, 
I think, uh, you know, there's a huge debate in lots of states about whether or not we should restart our testing infrastructure. Mm. Um, in some ways, it seems like having kids focus on standardized tests in the midst of a pandemic is probably not the best use of their time. Um, it also seems very, very... <laughs> that, do many people argue that particular point? No, oh, yeah, no, I think I think across the states, there are, I, I'm sure there are advocates in almost every department of yeah. education. There's certainly advocates on the kind of center-right education policy platform that say, we need to have these tests right now to figure out what's working and what's not. Um, and yeah, they're really st strong advocates of that perspective. Um, you know, and I think if there's some, you know, there, it seems like there conceivably is some truth to the idea that if we're going to find out that certain techniques are working better than other techniques, maybe that will show up in testing data. It also seems like overwhelmingly we're going to find um, that, uh, you know, students who weren't connected to the internet didn't learn very much over the last nine months. That seems like um, the kind of research question you do not have to ask, but anyway. Yeah. There it is. Well, good. Well, John Palfrey, enormously helpful to have this conversation with you. The book, The Connected Parent is coming out. Um, very soon. Is there anything else that uh, you want to, you want our, our audience to know about where to find the book or how to read more about it or things like that? Oh, you're so nice. No, I mean, it's certainly the, the Berkman Klein uh, Center, which is your neighbor in Cambridge, Mass, uh, has more uh, in its youth and media lab and, and certainly check out the, the MacArthur Foundation overall. But uh, mostly I look forward to um, seeing Failure to Disrupt on the bookshelves as well. Justin, I hope people will, will uh, buy that as well, as you as you say uh, in, the, in your nice introduction, that they'll find a good local bookstore to, to grab it at rather than just reading it on screen. That's right. It's been seen at least once uh, on a Cape Cod bookstore on a shelf. Um, awesome. so, I, so I know that it's possible. And we'll put links to MacArthur and to Berkman Youth and Media and to The Connected Parent in the show notes. I um, appreciate that. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks for coming. Appreciate your time. That was John Palfrey, the president of the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. Our conversation spanned topics about parenting, about schools, about philanthropy. And certainly I think one really important takeaway is to think about ourselves as philanthropists during these challenging times and to really think about not just how we give to the people who are closest to us and most like us, but how we give to people who are in different life circumstances than us as well. John's book, The Connected Parent, is out now, um, and we'll have links to it in the show notes so you can check it out. I'm Justin Reich. Thanks for listening to Teach Lab. Please subscribe to Teach Lab to get future episodes on how educators from all walks of life are tackling distance learning during COVID-19. I've also just released a new book, Failure to Disrupt, Why Technology Alone Can't Transform Education, available from booksellers everywhere. You can read reviews, related media, and sign up for online events at failuretodisrupt.com. That's failure to disrupt.com. If you have a book and you're enjoying it, um, go ahead and leave a review on Amazon or on Goodreads. This episode of Teach Lab was produced by Amy Corrigan and Garrett Beasley, recorded and sound mixed by Garrett Beasley. Stay safe until next time.